Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Maurice Young, and I'm homeless. I am not what some would consider formerly homeless or previously homeless. I, am what I would like to think or call myself actively homeless. Today, I've been invited out to talk to you about why I do what I do. Now, this is very different for me because normally when people invite me out to speak, I talk about what I do. And I do that in a way or in the capacity of raising awareness for the homeless and for the homeless community. So today, to talk about why I do what I do, um, I had to do some soul searching first. And in that process, uh, I looked at the events that have led up to today. But then I said, I need a starting place. So I had to go back in time and try to figure out where did, where did it all start to set these events in motion. So I found myself flashing back to, my, to mm, about 25 years or so ago when I was a younger man starting out on that American dream journey. I remember I was driven. I had a list in my mind, a list for success. So I had the do's and don'ts, the do and don't list of success going on in my mind. And on my do list, it was the typical uh, finish college, get that great career, um, get married, buy the dream house, have kids, et cetera, et cetera. But on the don't list, which was a very len a lengthy list, uh, there were the top three line items was most important to me on that don't list. And they were, don't get a divorce, don't get a divorce, and don't get a divorce. Because I had seen the impact of a divorce uh, and it was just like devastating to me. So that was what was driving me or kind of set things in motion. So we fast forward to 2011, 2011. And here I am coming through divorce number three, which I think is kind of ironic because that was the first three things on that list. <laughs> so I immediately, I was in a spot where I was kind of devastated. And I knew that I needed to clear my head because I remember thinking, how did I get here? And this is not where I wanted to be, by no means. So, uh, but I also remember I was thinking very clear at that time, extremely clear, because I remember saying to myself, this is divorce number three, and who's the common denominator? Yours truly. So I immediately said, I need to clear my head. I need to kind of get somewhere and get, you know, get a reset or a do over or something. So I moved myself down to the local shelter, to the men's shelter. And I chose that because I knew nobody in my network, friends or family would look for me there. So I think, you know, I get to the shelter and all is well. So the first two days, it was just how I anticipated. It was quiet, reflective, and I kind of had time to myself to just, you know, just to see what was going on with me. So as the days progressed though, I noticed something very interesting. So the homeless people in the shelter were kind of being treated really bad. And um, it was a turning point for me because I had always considered the shelter to be a part of the faith-based community and the faith-based community an extension of the church. So the church wouldn't treat the people this way was my thought process. So. I'm the type of person who I'm, I'm all about uh, doing something about something if there's a problem. You know, if you're not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. So I said, I would just assert myself. So I just jumped in there and did what I could do at the mission. So there was a, one gentleman who would always walk through every day with all these papers in his hands. And I struck up a conversation and, you know, and I found out those were applications and he just needed some help filling out the applications. So uh, the long term problem there was he couldn't read. So after we got done with the applications, um, I asked him if I could tutor him. He was excited about that. And then we worked together. Then the second individual in the, in the program uh, was autistic. And he literally needs somebody to hold his hand all the way through the SSI process. And I had all the time in the world. So he became the second person that I helped. And there was a quite, a few more, quite a few more people that I helped in that process as well. But the third, the, one of the gentlemen who really stood out to me was this 18 year old young man who came into the mission and he got my attention because at 18 years old I didn't even know where the mission was but yet there he was 
So we talked and I found out that his mom had passed away. They lived in Section 8 housing and he did not know how to conduct that business to transfer whatever needed to be transferred to him. So he left and was at the shelter. His grandmother and him were having a conversation about her setting money aside and buying him a bus ticket, which was about $35, you know, about 35 bucks. So, you know, I, hey, we can do that now. So uh, I asked him if I could help him. He said, sure. We walked to the, to the Greyhound bus station, got the ticket, and all was well. But what was most interesting about that situation, so as he's getting on the bus, uh, he turns around and launches this hug on me, and I'm just like standing there just like kind of, I'm overwhelmed, I'm just like, whoa, okay, okay. So he's crying, and then I'm crying, so we're both sitting in Greyhound crying, and I'm trying to figure out why do I feel this way? You know, I've helped people before, I've done things before, but this was kind of different, and I didn't understand what that was about. So he left, and I headed back to the mission, and this was a very pivotal day because as I got back to the mission, what we normally do, we would go in and sit in a day room and watch TV, or you would sit around in chairs and kind of talk to each other. But next to the uh, day room was a chapel. And I always like to go into the chapel and sit and kind of process the day, journal a little bit, and kind of strategically set up for the following day. So I go around, and I always sit in the same place in the chapel. So I go around the corner, and I go in, and there's a line of people standing there waiting for me. And that was a very profound moment for me because I knew right there as I looked at those faces who just needed some help, very simple help, that that's what I wanted to do. That is absolutely positively what I wanted to do. So that night I had a conversation in my bunk. What does that look like? What does that look like doing this? And I said, because I can go home and lock up the house, put the cars in the garage, take a few weeks off work, but that's just a camping trip. But what I need to do is I need to create in my life the exact same needs that the people have in their lives. How do I do that? How do I become indigenous to this population? So it became very clear for me, you gotta let everything go. So that's what had to happen. And I was okay with that. So when I speak, normally when I speak, um, people ask me the question, how hard was it to let everything go? So I jokingly tell them, and feel free to laugh, I said, remember I told you I was coming through divorce number three? It lightened my load considerably. <laughs> So we forward to today, here we are today, and there is a quote that resonates with me from the writer and the poet Mark Twain, and it says, there, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you know why. So unbeknown to me, when I moved myself to that shelter, I was allowing myself to be planted, and this I didn't know. And when I asserted myself with helping the people in the shelter, putting the needs of others before myself, which we did in the shelter, and then after I left the shelter, I became grounded and rooted in something wonderful, something, something just an, an unspeakable joy, if you will. So when people ask me today, will you ever go back? Do you miss it? Or, I mean, what does that look like? I tell them, listen, when I was, whatever I was grounded and rooted in, there was a transformation that took place in that process. My mind has been renewed in sorts. So I kind of see things differently. But whoever I was when I came out of divorce number three and who I am today are two totally different people. So I cannot go back. In fact, what I anticipate is whatever pushes through the ground, that will be my new life. And that's what I look forward to in the future. So to answer that question, why do I do what I do? Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I humbly submit to you this answer. I do what I do because that's who I am. And I would like to thank all the people who allowed me to come into their lives and help them and be me. Thank you very much. <laughs>